Hey, tonight uh, we will have our final campus community for uh, this particular semester. We're going to have a Christmas campus community, all right? So it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Buckle up. It's going to be a lot of fun. 7.30 in this very room. Um, I've been here at Liberty University on, on uh, staff now for a little bit over three years. And uh, the very first week that um, I sat down with the convocation staff, we began to dream and talk and write down not just guests that we wanted to have, but honestly conversations that we knew we wanted to have. I knew right off the bat that I wanted to have conversations about things like racism, about sex trafficking, about world hunger. I knew that we wanted to have um, conversations that many times people just kind of turn up the volume and walk away from, uh, but we wanted to address and not just be made aware of, but say, how do we become the solution as the people of God? And one of uh, those topics was domestic violence. There are two topics that I have had a really tough time, honestly, um, helping uh, our team wrap an entire convocation and shedding that kind of spotlight on, and one of them is mental health issues. The church doesn't really know a lot of times, sadly, what to do with mental health issues. It's an exhausting topic for the church to tackle. And the weird thing is, a lot of churches have a lot of uh, infrastructure to help with all kinds of communities, but they don't know how to come alongside of a mom and dad who have a child maybe who has mental health issues. Or they don't sometimes know not to Jesus juke somebody and just say, get over it or, or fix it. When someone actually needs help, they need medication, and that's not a lack of faith if they're taking medication, for example, to help them with mental health issues. And so we need to get better at that, and we want to be the kind of people who address that. We've, we, we're always looking for people who can give us that that kind of platform to talk about that. Another one that's been very tough has been the topic of domestic violence. Honestly, as a pastor, I can tell you uh, the reason it's tough is because the church, the church isn't equipped with the counselors that it needs. The average church in America spends over 90 percent of its budget on, on staffing and facilities. And so by the time you take that other 10 percent and you do missions and you do other things that people think are important, that are important, a lot of times there's not a whole lot of resources left to tackle something like domestic violence. And the church, honestly, a lot of times, again, uh, doesn't understand how to take someone who is a villain and to walk them and disciple make them to become someone who finds victory. A lot of times the guy that's, uh, you know, uh, domestically abusing his family might be a church member and might, might be confused, and, and a lot of times people don't know how to deal with a, a tithing elder at their church who has all the right Bible verses, but yet at home turns into a monster. And so we've got to get better as a church in addressing that. And uh, a friend of mine came to me a few months ago and said, hey, I want to tell you about uh, a young man who has recently in the last three years, almost four years, um, taken the hard road of redemption in his life, uh, a, a young man by the name of Ray Rice. And when he said that name, Ray Rice, instantly I thought about football, but I thought about what many of you think about. I thought about that, that video I saw that TMZ released and sold about Ray Rice hitting his fiance at that time, uh, Janae, and, and it went viral, and all of us were angry as we saw it. And my friend said, um, here's a young man who made a horrific mistake, but what people don't know is post that, there's been a, a beautiful story of redemption in the life of this young man. Uh, he's now married to the young lady, uh, and he's a, a great father and a great coach, and, and honestly, their faith has been their, their walk with God has been the platform, has been the foundation by which he's been able to build out uh, so much of his restoration story. And, and my friend said this to me, he said, I think it's an important story for your students to hear because they need to hear that they're bigger than one big mistake, that, that although they might, uh, you know, excuse themselves or although they might disqualify themselves from a job or certain things, right, because of a mistake, they never disqualified themselves from the love of Christ. They never qualify themselves from the power of the gospel. And honestly, every one of us need to hear that because the question isn't if we ever make a mistake, the question is when. 
And, and I'm talking all of us, right? All of us are consistent in being inconsistent. And, and, and it might not be as drastic as the one that Ray committed, but certainly we all need to understand that God never gives up never gives up on us. Now, that said, as much as I love that story and we wanted that, um, I, I had been wanting for, for three years to do something on domestic violence, uh, you know, and I, and, I, and I knew that October was that month, the Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and so we, I asked my friend, I said, could he come in October so that we could use that platform to talk beyond Ray's story, and he said no, he actually volunteers and coaches at a high school and travels and speaks to teams like Notre Dame and Alabama and South Carolina, and he, he goes with the NFL and talks to freshmen coming in about choices and talks against bullying, and so October is a month where He's kind of locked and loaded already for serving in those contexts, but, but he said, uh, we can maybe get him this semester still, and that's why he's here instead uh, of October. But I want us today, look at me, to not just hear his story. I want you to put a mirror in front of yourself and ask yourself, ask yourself, are there things in my life that are setting me up? Are there, are there sins in my life that I've underestimated? And, and I've overestimated my own ability, you know, to deal with those sins. Are there things in my life that I am, am, am a part of that are setting me up for that kind of a failure? And, and I think that past that, there's also a lot of handles on today, because we have a, a panel, including several students who are going to give their stories on the panel anonymously that are going to address this, that's going to go way beyond Ray's story of victory. Here's why that's important. Let me just say this to you before we watch this uh, intro video. Um, there are people in this room who do, not, who do not receive today from a posture of victory. Praise the Lord that God has allowed Ray, right, to be able to find victory in Christ, to be able to, to find restoration in his marriage. Praise the Lord that his daughter, you know, will watch a video like today on top of videos like the one where TMZ released in the elevator. But look at me. There are students here, and you, they're sitting here, who are never going to get, I'm sorry, who are never going to get restoration because because the person who, who harmed them is no longer even in their life and not interested, or they're in the middle of that. And they need to hear this today to be reminded about the power of God, but they also need to hear clearly, look at me, that the church, the church does not help somebody when they uber-spiritualize it and say, well, forgiveness means forgiveness in that there is no repentance or no accountability. Uh, some of the godliest things that can happen out of something like the today is for someone to just finally call the police department. For someone to finally have a tougher conversation to say, I'm going to honor the person who's hurting me by holding them accountable to the action. And so today has multiple layers in it, and I believe you have the maturity to walk out of here today and say, how can I be a part of the solution? Honestly, in the life of some of the very people that are in the hallways and the dorms of our very university. We are not immune to this. We are not. Many, many cases this semester of domestic violence and cases of it here on our campus. So I know that you have the maturity to sit through this and listen to it, but I'm praying that you have the fervency and the heart to say, I want to be a part of the solution. All right, let's watch this together. Knocking her out cold inside a hotel elevator. Baltimore Ravens terminated Ray Rice's contract. The team moved quickly to cut the running back as a video of Rice and his then fiance, now wife, went viral.
And so obviously there's a gravity uh, when we uh, watch that video and there is um, a, a heaviness, I think, in, in our hearts when we see that because it, it's very personal for a lot of us. I was not immune to uh, domestic violence in my own history, and certainly the Lord has used that tragedy to turn it into testimony. And I want you to, to right off the bat, Ray, tell our st students why you decided to, to come here today. This isn't three weeks after the event. This is um, three years after. You've spoken in much bigger platforms than this, whether you were on television in front of millions of people to tell this story. But a lot of people um, make a mistake like that and then go into the shadows. They just get bitter and angry that people are just um, not even willing to hear them out or give them a chance or exude grace, uh, sadly even the church, and then they just walk away and go into hiding and anger. And, and um, you've done the opposite. You've taken three years to work on your walk with the Lord, to, to, to you and Janae have gotten married, you've quit drinking, you've gone to counseling. Uh, I heard that you were supposed to go to a certain amount of counseling, and when it was done legally, you continued to go past that because you were like, I still need to be, you know, uh, broken down and rebuilt back up by God. So, brother, why are you here today? Why are you putting yourselves out in front of us and the football teams that you go to speak to? Um, why have you decided to, to speak out? Uh, quite frankly, just to save lives. I think that um, being in my situation, uh, you know, coming from my background, I think, you know, you put me out there to be like a superstar. And I think today's superstars get mistaken for, you know, like godly figures. And I realized that in my life, everything that I had been through, that um, number one, I wasn't perfect. And, you know, my story, I know just from everything that I went through as a kid, as, you know, um, without making any excuses, definitely tied into, you know, where I'm at today in a, definitely a different place. And, you know, but this is truly here to help you guys out, to, um, to save lives, to be transparent. Um, first and foremost, this is um, everything I will say today is without making excuses. This is just more of uh, my journey, and uh, my journey might be different from your journey. Um, but the one thing I do know is that, uh, you know, I will be real and I will be honest with you, you know, on everything I, I do tell you today. Um, as much as it's about domestic violence, I think that in life, um, what I've really learned is um, the decision-making process that we all go through at certain points of life that you know, um, I used to preach to kids, I still do. I still do go out and talk to kids. I talk about, you know, one or two bad decisions in life. You know, your dream, you, I believe you can live your dream. I really do. Whatever you set your mind out to be, I do believe you can do it. But I also said one or two bad decisions in life, you know, your dream can become a nightmare. Well, here I am today, uh, 30 years old, you know, having lived the dream, of being an NFL superstar, won a Super Bowl, three Pro Bowls, financially set, but I also lived a nightmare. Uh, and that nightmare I talk about, um, as much as I can talk about domestic violence, that nightmare is everything in my life that I kind of brushed up under the rug. Mm. And me going through everything I went through with domestic violence actually uncovered the, the brutal truth that I was just, you know, I was actually becoming a better football player, but I was, I was becoming a, you know, a really bad person. And um, I do believe that God doesn't make mistakes and um, without making any excuses, I definitely am in a better place today. You know, I have a young daughter who's five and I have a son now and that's one. And um, I said in my career, I did too much trying to be the man instead of trying to be a man. You know, you can be the man for a moment. We all know those superstars. They're only the man for a moment, you know, but you can be a man for a lifetime. And I think that um, now I'm kind of walking the journey of, um, you know, I can't wait to start taking my daughter out on dates. You know, so I can open the door for her, pull up, pull up a chair for her, you know, just to show her the kind of the finer things in life that, 
you know, how a man is supposed to treat a, you know, treat a woman. And, you know, um, those are just things that I kind of, you know, had, you know, where I had failed miserably beyond domestic violence. You know, I just failed miserably in terms of my career of putting my career first instead of putting my wife first. And I think that, you know, I had it all wrong. I had football, family, then God. Mm. You know, reverse that order. Anything in life is supposed to be God, you know, family, and then whatever else comes next after that. And um, as simple as that being said, I think, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people who have that, have that order mixed up. And I had that order mixed up for a very long time. Yeah, Ray, wow, that's, that's raw and honest. And, um, take us back to your childhood. I know that um, so much of your story of what happened that night, like you just said, was really the fruit of stuff that was rooted before. I mean, before that night, you had never physically been abusive to Janae, but certainly emotionally, and, and you guys were uh, pretty drunk that night. And so much of what had happened in your psyche, so much of what had happened in your upbringing, so much of what somebody is um, signing multi-million dollar deals and you have an entourage telling you how awesome you are working on. Yeah, tell, take us through your childhood a little bit, some of the things so that I think our students need to understand how those things shape even them in their own life? Well, um, before I take you back to my childhood, I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about um, certain things I learned about domestic violence. And I think that, uh, you know, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but um, there's certain things about domestic violence. I think that, you know, um, what you see is only the physical side of things. You only hear about somebody saying somebody got hit or this, this, that, and the other. Well, domestic violence, it is shared in many forms, There's a, in, and it's all forms of abuse, whether, whether it's um, emotional, verbal, um, financial. You know, some, somebody in the household is making more money than the other, they kind of use that, you know, as a, as a tool to, you know, be divisive and things like that. So when you guys understand domestic violence, just understand that it comes in many forms. Mm -hmm. It's not as much, I mean, we all know the physical side of it, but you know, they say sticks and stones may, you know, <laughs> may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Well, that's not true. You know, if you love someone and you care about them, you know, watch what you say to them. Because, you know, I think um, that was a big part of what I experienced growing up in my household, uh, growing up as a kid. You know, they said, I met with a group and they asked me, had I ever, you know, experienced violence before as a kid? Well, yeah, I grew up in a bad neighborhood. I seen people fighting. You know, I seen drugs. I seen a lot of things, right? And they said, no, did you see any violence in the home? So I said, well, my mom, my father was killed when I was not even one, not even one. So I never knew my dad. And, um, but my mom went through a pretty bad marriage. And um, I remember the verbal abuse during that time. I remember my mom, you know, basically becoming something that she wasn't. And what was my escape through that? And they asked me, said, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. I played football. I went to practice, you know, so I kind of just played football. My mom could have been going through something at home and football was my blanket. Sports was my blanket, you know, for everything that was going on at home. And I'm the oldest of four. I have two younger brothers and a sister. And if I fast forward that and just get into high school and get into college, you know, um, I blanketed all those problems with football. You know, home was just not, you know, it was the old saying of mom keeping the old roof over your head. And I love my mom dearly. She did, she's my best friend. She does everything for me. Hard conversations I had with her, but when I got in college, something was missing. And, you know, I played my last college game and, you know, I realized that, you know, I went home and like I said, I, I didn't like going home much, but the last time I came home from college, I didn't have a bed, you know? So I was like, okay, something's not right. I'm on scholarship. I got a nice bed at college. I'm going back to school. 
Well, that's when I made the decision to leave college early. So we go back to decision making, and this is all without making any excuses. This is just what went on in my life. Um, I made a decision to leave college um, based on financial reasons. I had negative $600 in my account, and I had a chance to go play in the NFL. So when I think about that, that decision, that decision right there really changed the whole dynamic in life. And this is when my wife comes into the picture. So my wife I've known since high school. We've, um, we've known each other since we were 15, 16 years old. And um, she stuck with me throughout college and she's known me before everything. And um, so basically when I got to the NFL, I left college with negative $600 in my account. And I got to the NFL, and now I have six figures with massive problems at home. Um, I'm now covering everything for my mom. Once I realized I was living better than her at college, I left. The dynamic was that was that my wife, she easily came on the back burner of things in, in my life. And I'm just not proud of that because you know, she's the one who stuck with me through thick and thin, you know, when I didn't have anything, you know, when I was struggling to even wear a sweater in college, she would have to be the one to get me clothes and things like that. So it just goes back to decision making and, but my childhood definitely played a part, you know, and the financial needs and all that stuff played a part in me becoming financially abusive, you know, me because I was making all the money in the house you know, saying things I'm very not, I'm not proud of. And um, that cycle went on for some years and just not proud moments. And um, today I learned, you know, you know, with or without football, you know, family is forever. And, and I put my faith first, and faith, faith first and got counseling. And a lot of people say, what is counseling? So when you hear about counseling, they think it's just a method to kind of, you know, redeem your story. Um, that, that's not it. Um, my counselor was the first, I uh, dealt with a guy named Dr. Ball. He was the first guy who basically stripped me of myself. He said, we got to get rid of the old, he, we got to get rid of Ray Rice. And um, we got to get Ray Mel Rice. We have to get him back. You know, Ray Rice is the football player and um, that's who you were. We have to create a new identity for you. And I think um, that was the form of counseling that I took. I wanted to get rid of my old self. Your story is so, such a reminder that just money just makes you more of who you are. You know, if, 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 you're, if you're broken and the dad issues in your life weren't solved and all these things, there's a lack of discipline, then finances come in, it just makes you more of who you are. It just, if you're angry, it just allows you to get more angry. If you're um, inconsistent, money just gives you the opportunity. But if you're giving, it becomes that. And then this doctor comes in and starts talking to you. At what point did faith become, your walk with the Lord become a big part of your, your marriage's re redemption? Uh, back then, y'all weren't even married, and you, um, uh, you know, had a baby already, and then you also, you know, that night you were drunk. And you can clean up the act again. You can stop drinking. You can stop the, the, the actions. But at what point did God go beyond just the behavior and get into your identity? Tell us about your faith in, in the Lord Jesus. Well, um, sounds cliche. I grew up in the church and, you know, I had never really understood everything that was going on as a young kid. And, you know, um, my counselor is actually a pastor and he's a faith-based um, faith faith-based counselor, so everything that we did in counseling was based on um, principles, you know, of the Bible and, and understanding everything, and my walk with the Lord became a lot deeper in, in, in counseling. Um, it was the first time I really understood the Bible. It was the first time I understood, um, you know, what sacrifices meant what forgiveness was 
that someone else had suffered for us, that they really endured pain and agony, and, and it was the first time I really understood it. And because um, you can hear about, you know, Bible verses and you hear about different things, but it was the first time where I actually read it and understood it. And um, be honest with you, my, my, my walk with God and my faith was the first time in my life where I didn't feel alone. It was the first time in my life where I wasn't afraid to ask for help. It was the first time in my life where, you know, you hear, you know, I, I didn't hear the term man up and things like that. You know, man up is, you know, a very cliche term. You know, how could you be a man and you never knew what it was to be a boy? You know, because that's how I essentially, you know, kind of tell my story where, you know, I started paying bills at 11 years old. And I, I felt like I had lost my childhood, you know, when I made it to the NFL. So everything I didn't do as a boy, I did when I made it to the NFL. And, um, but it was the first time I didn't feel alone. I didn't feel vulnerable asking for help. You know, um, it was the first time I actually knew it was okay to cry. You know, how many times as a man, I'm sure, you know, certain men in here, um, you know, you're afraid to let out a good cry because you feel vulnerable. Well, vulnerability is a good thing. You, you, you have to make yourself vulnerable to go out there and um, actually understand, you know, letting yourself go. You know, and I think that um, that's part of the message here today. You know, anybody that's out there going through something, don't have to be domestic violence. You know, um, you got to be cur courageous enough to ask for help. I know this topic is not easy, but you have to ask for help and you have to know what help looks like. Because I'll be honest, I didn't know what help looked like. I didn't even know what help felt like. Because the only thing I realized that I thought was help was actually going to buy something. I thought if I bought something, you know, when I felt bad, it was going to make me feel better. Well, today, half of that stuff is at home collecting dust. I might have to go put it on eBay. <laughs> so. Hey, before we ask a few of our friends to join us in this discussion, um, you talk a lot about your daughter, Raven, growing up. And when this happened almost four years ago, she was an infant, and now she's grown. And um, the other day, I saw a video where you were saying she now has her own iPad, and you're always thinking about the day that she f watches that video, that TMZ video that was released, you know, of that, of that elevator moment. And um, you, you talk about how you want to be able to have that discussion with her. Um, talk to us about that, would you? And, and just as a father, um, dealing with this. Uh, yeah, as a father, um, um, it's definitely a hard, it, it's definitely going to be a hard conversation, but, you know, I'm, being that my situation was so public, I think that, um, you know, me understanding that, you know, today, this community, our community, I, I believe we all are living in the scariest times, um, and it's the social media era. Mm. And um, the fact that my daughter, you know, now can grab an iPad and you know, um, she's very intelligent, she can Google her father, and you know, um, I think about that every day. You know, my walk in life now is basically, you know, retracking the steps to be able to ha have that hard conversation with her. You know, I want to be open and transparent with my daughter so that, to be honest, I, I know she's gonna date, you know, I know she's gonna, you know, grow up, and um, that stuff's gonna happen, but I wanna be able to at least, you know, have the respectful conversation so she understands, you know, what it's supposed to look like. And um, that, that's something I think about all the time. I do think about it all the time, and I also think about, you know, um, just her being my daughter, you know, and the facts of um, the eyes where we live in a society where we have to understand that, you know, public opinion does matter. You know, it can sway the things, go left, right, and um, you don't want to be in a situation where something that's out there of you is not represented properly. But, you know, um, this is a place of forgiveness, and um, 
just want you guys to be mindful of the era that you're living in. You are living in the social media era, so just be careful, you know, what you put out there. Including commentary on someone's life as a believer and the, uh, the opportunity that we have to speak life into someone who maybe has made a horrific mistake. Um, I want you to know something. I want you to know that when your little girl Googles her dad's name, that a lot of football will show up, and yes, um, a press conference that you're not proud of or a, uh, a moment in that elevator will show up, but I want you to know that this moment will also show up and that she'll see that you've come to help us, brother. Understand this, learn from it. Yeah. I, um, I've asked a few folks to come and join us um, who honestly deal with this from a more clinical, professional level and um, have walked in this with us. We also have a video of people who are gonna join us on the panel that don't want to join us necessarily physically on stage because they want to stay um, somewhat anonymous in telling their stories. But um, oh, then we have a student who has been able to, as a community group leader, help out a student who's in that video. But I want you to really pay attention to this video. And then we're going we're gonna to walk out of testimonial mode here and really walk into some practical things that we can do together. All right. Um, let's, let's watch this together. to take a few minutes and have a conversation with a few Liberty students. It's one thing to hear the redemptive story of the Rice family and to even slow down and talk about the horrific actions of Ray Rice and to learn from him. But it's a whole other thing to have a very honest conversation with four Liberty students who maybe at this very moment have yet to even find the restoration that the Rice family have. As brave as these students are collectively, we have decided to make them anonymous because many of them have yet to see restoration in their situation. But this isn't just about their stories. We believe every person who hears them share today have a call to action, a responsibility to move forward in light of the things that they share. So we'd love for you all to share your story. I grew up in a home where I didn't see my parents argue until middle school and I, I thought everything was great and my dad was like my best friend. My dad was my role model. My dad and my uncle and my grandpa sent me down and said, hey, your 13th birthday, today you're going to be a man. Here's a shot of whiskey and here's a pack of cigarettes. I can just remember from that point on, there was this shift in the way that my dad would interact with me, where he would point out someone emotional or someone crying and say, that's a lot of weakness. You're acting kind of weak right now. You don't want to be like that. The yelling and the terror of my dad's gonna come storm me up the steps and I have no idea what's gonna happen next. Not being able to fall asleep at night and just crying myself to sleep because I didn't know um, as a little girl where I'd gone wrong. I grew up in a home where it was normal for rage to be a part of it, screaming fights every single day. I would wake up to my parents screaming at each other um, in the mornings or I would wake up to doors slamming or loud footsteps. I remember telling my mom that I would never grow up and treat my children the way my dad treated me. So I guess it started back in elementary school when I would just hear like my parents just like yelling all the time. He was very verbally and physically abusive towards my mom and he never like hit us but he very like he put our lives in danger for sure. I remember one time my sister and I were hiding in my room like just listening to the screaming and like my mom comes upstairs like bruises, like crying. She's like, are you guys okay? Like, we're gonna be okay. And my dad comes up, like raging drunk. And he's like, you guys aren't actually my kids. And then he like disappeared for three days. I haven't seen him in five years now. He just twists the Bible and says, well, I'm your father. You don't get to question me. Aren't you a good Christian? Don't you know like what the Bible says about honoring your father? And, and so it's just, it's all this continual twisting and manipulation. I can remember a specific point 
when it turned in my head of okay maybe I maybe this is like what being a man is about or maybe like this manipulative way of dealing with people to get what you want maybe that's what being a man is about and I can remember myself slipping into that manipulative cycle with people that I had relationships with my dad got married to my mom and they had another daughter and she's incredible. It was really hard for me coming to college and knowing she's still gonna be at home. It's hard for me because she's still there in the situation and um, there's nothing I can really do about it. And it's kind of made me feel powerless and almost like there's guilt in my life because I've left her behind. Somebody who was so close to me that was supposed to protect my heart and love me was, because of his own sin and his own life, was misusing that. I just tell my mom, like, my dad will be so lucky when I turn 18 if I ever speak to him again because I want nothing to do with him. And I think that's where the bitterness and the anger started to start taking root in my heart. So like a few, like fast forward a few years later, after getting out of middle school, I like met this guy. We ended up starting dating. The first few months were okay, and then as we got more into the relationship, the more I saw similar patterns to my dad, but I didn't want to admit it. There was a lot of just like yelling and just like a lot of verbal abuse, like I like denied it up until the point we broke up. I remember going home and just like crying out to the Lord and be like, Lord, like protect my heart. Like I don't know what that looks like, but just protect it. And then the next day, we broke up. And I just remember sitting in my room and my mom comes and she's like, he was exactly like your father. And I was like, well, why did no one tell me? Like, that would have been nice to know. Going forward from that moment, I wanted to make sure I was not going to be in a relationship like that again. I have watched in my own life me become more easily angered when people will do little things that just get on my nerves. And when I do become angry, I can tend to be explosive with my anger. Just kind of like I've watched my dad over the years be like that. And it's painful for me to look back and, and see that I'm doing the very things that I've watched him do my whole life and hate. I was so heavily focused on, I'm not going to be my dad, I'm not going to be my dad, I'm not going to be my dad, that he, was, he consumed my image of everything. And then there was a shift from that to now my identity is I want to be like Christ. I find my identity in Christ. I want to be an imitator of God. My mentor was telling me, it's okay to feel hurt. You have every right in the world to feel those hurt feelings, to feel that deep longing for a father that loves you, because that's God's design. And the way that this sin is manifesting and this abuse is not God's design for you, and it's not God's design for a family. If we want, so we want something to change, we want something to be different and the abuse to stop, like, I just needed to stop allowing it. So by that, I just was like, like, no, like, I'm not going to see you. I'm not going to go over there anymore until, like, this stops. Something has to give. And that just means, like, not see my father until he can get the help he needs. Abuse is abuse, no matter um, what form it's taking on. It took me up until this year to really label it as abuse at all, and it took my CGL to make me realize that. That's just really the hardest thing is calling it what it is. It's abuse. So hearing Ray's story gives me hope that I can have restoration with my father. Hearing Ray's story, I've realized that shedding light on sin is loving. So hearing Ray's story, I'm grateful that God's reminded me that no one's out of God's reach and that everyone and everything can be redeemed. It's easy to look at Ray's story and point a finger at his sins, but for me, in hearing his story, I'm able to realize the sins in my own life and, and see the magnitude of them. Looking back, I wish that I hadn't have normalized my situation, that I had someone to reach out to sooner, and that I hadn't have beat myself up and made it seem like I didn't have control over the situation. 
If in hearing my story, you connect with being abused, get help, find community, you're not alone in this. And the first step of action is finding someone who can help you and reminding you who you are in the king. If in hearing my story, you connect with the fact that there are things going on that you don't want to talk about, I want to ask you to not be afraid, to be bold in saying that something's going on and to be courageous in getting help for that. It doesn't matter if it's like a fist or if it's words or messing with emotions, it's abuse and it's not right. That's the bottom line. If in hearing my story, you don't feel that you connect with being abused or being an abuser, that doesn't excuse you or give you the right to be a passive bystander. You still need to be community to people and be loving towards people who you see as struggling with that or going through that. We've asked our panel. We've, um, we've asked our panel to just join us in this discussion. Um, and um, I'd love to just start with you, Dr. D. You, this, is, this is your life calling, equipping the saints to do the work of this kind of ministry. And um, I, I would just love for you to just, uh, could you just slow down for just a second and um, just define for us clearly? Because I think. The enemy loves to confuse as much as 1%, some statistics tell us, 1 to 5% of those who are being abused even have the courage to speak up like these students um, and even talk about it and vocalize it. You've got others who maybe sometimes label something abuse when it was just really um, discipline. And so I'd love for you to give us a professional um, definition of what abuse is for us. Sure. Well, first I want to say thank you to those students because what they have done is one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing, is taking that first step and being courageous. And Ray, you alluded to this already, but domestic violence, intimate partner violence, family violence, it has a lot of different names, but it takes a lot of different forms. So it's not just physical abuse, it can also be emotional abuse, it can be belittling and criticizing. You're never good enough, you're never going to amount to anything. You know, taking down someone's self-worth and pulling them apart in that way it can take other psychological forms. It can be financial, like Ray alluded to, where one partner makes maybe more of the money, but then also controls all of the money. And um, there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of intimidation that's used when someone is uh, in a situation with any type of domestic violence. And what I would say to that is as many forms as domestic violence can take, so can redemption and restoration. So while we hear Ray's story, and that may be something that we hope for and pray for in our own lives, it may not look that way, and that's okay. Um, what it may mean is that for you, taking that step, being courageous, being bold, and getting the help that you need, that's the path to redemption or restoration in your life, and that's very, very powerful. It's part of breaking the cycle. That's right. So, Doctor, uh, we have the definition that you gave us for this, um, that you teach, you know, um, as a professor here. Can you just expound on that? Let's, would you read that for us and then give us a little more sure. practicality around that? Sure. So this uh, definition comes from the U.S. Department of Justice, and their idea here is that abuse, domestic abuse, is a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship. It's used by one partner to gain and maintain power and control, and it can take all these different forms. It may be physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological actions, or threats of actions that someone takes in order to influence the other partner. So it may be behaviors that intimidate, criticize, manipulate, humiliate, isolate, and that's a real big one that we see, frighten or terrorize someone from getting the help that they need, or even believing that they're worth that help. Mm. And so you had, you, the other day we were talking about this, and you said it's the perpetual action of that as well. It's one thing if someone needs help because um, they just lost their temper or they, they made a mistake and it wasn't a recurring thing. It's another thing when it becomes a pattern mm -hmm. and the enemy tells the victims, it's normal. Everyone else has this in their home and everyone else is going through this. Um, and you have to get help so that someone who's not as emotionally 
in, stuck in the cycle mm -hmm. can speak into it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it doesn't even have to be that the first step is someone who's a professional mm -hmm. at it, like the, like the two of you. Uh, I just want to stop right here and, and, and um, talk about that on a very practical sense. Nikki is a community group leader here on campus. Nikki, tell a little bit, one, one of the videos we saw, one of the, one of the testimonies we heard is actually your friend. Uh, would you tell, talk to us a, a little bit about that? And I know you're not a professional counselor. You're just a, a godly young lady who noticed something about a friend. Uh, speak into that, if you would. Yeah, um, so I had multiple conversations with her that led up to having this sit down, and um, it's hard because she wasn't coming to me. She wasn't confiding in me, and I just, I had a gut feeling. Um, I had just thoughts that something was kind of off. So I called her into my room one day, and I just straight up asked her how her relationship with this person who was abusing her um, was like, and she had never labeled it as abuse in her life. She, um, like you said, it's, it was normal for her. And one thing that she said that stuck with me um, was just that she said, you know, he'll he'll yell or and scream or whatever, and he'll he'll always apologize afterwards. So I know that he really loves me. I know he doesn't mean it. And I just kind of looked at her, and that's when. Um, I think it just clicked that that's not normal um, and that's not okay. And just for him to say sorry and then do the same thing over again is like that cycle that we were talking about. Um, and so it's, it's hard. It's a hard conversation to have. Um, it's not easy. You don't want to step over the line. You don't know how they're going to receive it, if they will receive it or if they're going to shut down. Um, but it's a conversation that needs to be had and it's very important. You said two things I want to make sure our students really grab onto. Number one, you pulled her to the side. You didn't have a, you weren't in a community group with nine other young ladies and asking her where she would even feel more shame or more afraid to speak up in a bigger, so that has to happen more in a one-on-one -on -one in the beginning, at the very least. Later on, then community can come in. And then you also said, again, and the church gets this so many times wrong where forgiveness isn't biblical forgiveness, it's false forgiveness if it's not rooted in repentance. And so the Bible tells us to forgive our, our brothers as God has forgiven us, but God forgives us once we come to the end of ourselves. Like your counselor said, I, I, we got to get rid of all that's Ray Rice and, and make you the Ray Rice God has designed you to be. And so I love that you began that conversation, but it goes above your pay grade, right? Because you're just a friend but you need to then hold that friend's hand and walk him into bigger conversations. Yeah, so it's just cool to see how the Lord orchestrated it all because I had that conversation with her for about an hour and right after that I was meeting with Melanie Denny, uh, the LU Shepherd, and I was able to confide in her and just tell her what was going on. Um, so you know, you, you want to take on that burden with them, but there's also other resources that you can bring it up um, to that can actually get them help. And one thing I want to say to people who are being abused, um, just my friend, when we talked about this, she said, I don't know how to get him help. Like, I don't know how um, to introduce this to him. I don't know how to bring it up to him. And I said, the first step is that you need to get help too. And, um, you know, you need to be selfish. You need to focus on yourself because it's not always um, going to be the way that is picture perfect and they're going to get help. And it's going to be um, like the snap of your fingers. It's going to be better. Like, you need to get help and you need to go through the healing process just as much as they do. Nikki, my, my daughter is going to be at Liberty in a few years. And I pray that God puts... Um, a community with people like you in her life where she can um, walk out, you know, all the components of her faith, even the hardship of her life with another sister in Christ. Uh, speaking of, of being sensitive, Dr. Hawkins, uh, we were talking about this and you were talking about hardware and software and explaining to me from a professional stance how that plays out. I'd love to, for you to teach our students a little bit of that language so that they can know. One of our students, as a matter of fact, sir, uh, who was giving his testimony in that said whenever he smells tobacco yeah. instantly it triggers him to think about abuse from his father because his he would see like when my dad's going off the ledge again he's smoking even more and so when he smells tobacco there's a trigger when he sees violence that maybe someone's watching the walking dead and it doesn't mean much to them but to him it means more he's not on level ground and he's not asking everybody to walk in eggshells but yet at the same time be aware you know, like, like Nikki was. Can you speak a little bit into that so that we can, we can... Yeah, one of the things that I was thinking about sitting here was if you had parents and you grew up in a really safe home and they did a good job, you need to give them a note today and just give them an attaboy. But uh, some of us who are here in this uh, auditorium this morning, yeah, go ahead, clap for them if you did. But 
because some of you were fortunate enough to experience that, but some of us grew up in some really rough situations. And what I, what I think is difficult, even as I'm sitting here today and processing some of this, is to communicate the amount of pain and shame that we experienced. I remember um, I was the oldest of seven kids and my dad was an alcoholic. He came back from World War II and barely ever drew a sober breath after that. And I remember at 10 years old, I was the oldest, so I felt the responsibility to protect my mother and take care of my brothers and sisters. And uh, he was drunk and he was after my mother, I remember. And I, I got in between and I remember him putting his, he was, had me down on the floor and he was, I was literally blacking out. He was strangling me. And I remember hearing the sound. Two things I remember from that. One is, I remember the sound of a rolling pin hit him in the head and knocked him out cold. My mother saved my life that day. But I also remember the smell of stale beer as he was over top of me. And from that day to this, just the smell of beer, it just kind of triggers that whole thing. So those kinds of things are part of our life. And when that's happening, uh, we either get angry or we get depressed, depending upon the kind of personality we have. And I got very angry. And so at about 17, my dad started one day again into punching me and hitting me. And I just kept saying, do it again. Does it feel good? Do it again. And he did. And I turned around and with the clothes on my back, I walked out of the house, never looking back, never thinking about, you know, what would my brothers and sisters be thinking the next day? I was into so much pain that all I could think about was just saving my own soul, finding some kind of safety and deliverance. And I remember walking about 25 miles to a family that I had met. They took me in. I lived with them my senior year. and. Uh, what was interesting was I, I was okay in the hardware. My brain was working, but swirling around my brain was the software of anger and resentment. And I remember in school, I would feel victorious if I could get a teacher mad at me. If I could get a male teacher mad at me and come after me, I won. You know, they didn't realize what was going on, but I was winning because I mattered. You know, nothing was worse than just being ignored. But something very redemptive happened. I was going to a little church. I was running track that year and wrestling, and I was running past this church, and I met a pastor. And the pastor, one night I was there at church, and I had my hand on the door. We were all by ourselves. I was getting ready to leave. And uh, I remember saying this to him like it was yesterday, nobody loves me. And he looked at me, and for the first time in my life, a, a man that I had respect for said, you're wrong, Ron. I love you. And something inside of me literally broke. I started sobbing uncontrollably, and I was so embarrassed, and I just went out into the night. But you know, when we have that kind of pain, we have to medicate. And that gets us into all kinds of trouble because we make bad choices about what the medication is going to be. Sometimes it can be athletic, sometimes it can be academic, sometimes it can be booze, sometimes it can be sex or pornography, but you can't be in that much pain without medicating. And so across this auditorium today, gosh, so many of you are medicating and you've made bad choices, okay? And you got to stop. You got to stop. I was reading in the Bible where Jesus. Jesus was saying to his disciples, things in life are not going to be the way you want them to be. You're going to be persecuted. I'm leaving you. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be killed. All kinds of things are going to happen to you. But by endurance, take possession of your soul. And I, I want to share with you this morning how important it is that you take possession of your inner self. There have been some bad decisions. And I, this is something we can talk about. You can have conversations with your RAs and your spiritual directors. You can come out. But until you start to talk about it, it just, it's secret. The bad choices, the medications are secretive and oftentimes not really understood by ourselves. There's nothing wrong with being a professional football player and being really successful at it. But when it becomes your medication and you become the man because of this, all of a sudden you realize at a point in life something's not really working. But Jesus said, 
uh, in the Word of God, there are three tremendous resources. First, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, second, and working within a community of accountability. We have got to be accountable. Ray talked about a counselor who just was faith-based and who talked about God and about responsibility. What Paul envisions is a whole dehabituation, rehabituation process that results in the creation of a new person. I'm not who I was. There is a redemptive story in my life and in your life and in Ray's life, and we celebrate that. But somebody loved us. Somebody told us the truth. We got to a point of brokenness, and we began to go back and look at the resources that were available. And so, talk about it. If you felt that pain, if you felt that, you know, that comes from abuse, talk about it with people. And you don't have to be talking to an expert or a clinician. You can talk to somebody who's just a buddy who can say to you, I love you. Absolutely. That was really the biggest takeaway from your peers. Your, your friends in, in that video, all of them had one thing as an action point, and it was get out of the shell and have a conversation, get into community, because that's what the work of the enemy always is, is isolation, confusion, division, and the work of the spirit is always unity and clarity. And so that's why that's so, so vital. And again, we have been working together in preparation for this day, uh, not just to, to come in and have this conversation with you, but to say, we know that this is going to then um, need attention from a professional level, so uh, from Pathways to TRBC, who offers uh, professional counseling for free, to our Title IX office, to our professional counseling office, they're all available. And this isn't one of those moments where we walk you down to the front to connect with a shepherd, because again, that doesn't happen in a public setting where people can um, presume or, or be an inquiring mind that wants to know. In your hallways, there are people that just want to listen. It might even just be your roommate who then walks you over to the next step. But listen to me, if you're off campus, the, the building 17 is where the shepherds meet, and, and there are, I think, the first next step uh, from a professional sense, from us as a staff, to be able to listen and then walk with you, all right? Um, and, and, and I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't want it to be one of these things where somebody calls the authorities or someone calls a prosecutor, and, and certainly know that we have the herder in mind as well as the hurt, and that we believe the gospel can redeem because we see the power of that. But that, that means sometimes the way we honor someone is that we have to expose them. He was exposed, and it wasn't on his own, but that exposure has made you a better father, has made you a better husband, and today you're here to, to tell that story. And so I'd, I'd much rather you get help than, than it, your sin find you out in another sense. Uh, we, we're going to close in prayer. And I, I want to say that hurt people, hurt people, hurt people, and you, you, you hurt people, but hurt people hurt people, but at the same time healed people, brother, healed people can, can have the ability in the grace of God to also help heal people. And I believe that, sir, just as you've used your story and just as you told your story that even though you've been through a lot of hurt and that might have even meant that you were a herder, that God's healed you. And God's using you even today to help someone take a step towards, towards healing. And so we're grateful that you would be honest and vulnerable. Um, Doug, by the way, you come up real quick. Doug, I, I, Doug went through a lot of this in his life, and he has a real redemption story at the end. But I want Doug, one of our shepherds, to, to I know this is personal for him. Doug, I, I kept looking over at you, brother, and um, I could see that this was very, very personal for you. Um, Will you just close us out in prayer? Let's all stand together quietly. Just don't say anything. Just quietly stand together. And um, I want to do something that a lot of us sometimes think is kind of cheesy a little bit, but I think, I think it's symbolically important for us today. I believe it's symbolically important for us today to just grab a hand beside us, to so grab someone's hand. Don't, don't say anything. Just quietly grab the hand beside you. Shh. And here's why I want you to grab somebody's hand, because I want you to know that if you're hearing this today and your heart's beating really, really fast and, and it's just drawing up emotions, you're not alone. First and foremost, you have the Lord, and second, you have the Lord's people. 
And there's an action point here today for you to just go and grab someone's hand in a dorm or grab someone's hand in dorm 17 and say, I, I want to talk to somebody about what we talked about at Combo today. Brother, pray us out and, uh, and, and dismiss us. Let's pray. Thank you that you are the loving Father. Thank you that you are the healer of the hurt and the hurter. Thank you, O oh God, that you, that no one is ever too far gone to receive your restoration. God, I stand here just as Ray, just as Dr. Hawkins and, and others as a trophy of your grace that no one is too far gone. I thank you for the vulnerability. I thank you for the honesty for this hard conversation. I thank you for Pastor David in putting it on his heart to have this conversation. But I pray right now in the name of Jesus for individuals in this room, whether they're the herder or the hurt, that you would do profound ministry through the power of your Holy Spirit and that it would not end in this moment, but, but God, that if need be, that they would flood our offices at LU Shepherd or these counseling offices, whatever it takes for them to take the next step and start the process of healing. Let that be the case today. Let no one walk out of this room unaffected by this conversation. God, we love you, we praise you because you are our Savior, whom all of us need desperately. May each of us recognize that need today, celebrate it, and walk victorious in the love that you have given us. We praise you, Lord, for who you are and who you will continue to be because you are always faithful and you are always the same. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll see you tonight, hopefully at Campus Community, all right? Hey, I am so proud of you. Thank you so much. Let's go serve one another. You're dismissed.